uh, for the delay. So uh, that would be good. All right, anything else? Anything else? All right, then let's begin as we normally do then with a moment of silent prayer, giving ourselves an opportunity, if necessary, to use First John 1 9, the rebound technique that doesn't share the filling of God the Holy Spirit as we are cleansed uh, uh, in our soul from all unrighteousness. Any sin, any known and unknown sin is cleaned away so that we can experientially walk in the holiness and righteousness of God as we walk in the light and have fellowship with our Lord Jesus Christ. So if necessary, with a moment of silent prayer, let us pray. <coughs> And Heavenly Father, we come before you this day to praise you, to worship you, and now to glorify you through the study of your word. Father, we just thank you for all that you've done for us and our families this day, providing for every need in the physical and the spiritual realm. And Father, we can't thank you enough for all that you have done and uh, are doing for us and will do for us in the coming days, the great plan of our salvation that you have given to us, uh, your Son, Jesus Christ, and his word that strengthens and empowers us, your Holy Spirit uh, that moves us, uh, teaches us, and enables us to apply your word. And also, again, your great plan to walk in your will as we serve you uh, during our generation. And we just thank you, Father, for putting us in your plan and making us a part of it and uh, also giving us eternal salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we uh, just uh, uh, pray that especially this Christmas season that we're about to celebrate is one that uh, our country uh, unites around and gathers together to worship and to praise you and your Son, Jesus Christ, for coming into the world knowing that the reason for him coming to the world is to go to the cross to pay for our sins, through which we have salvation. So, Father, we just ask that this be a season of celebration in your great plan of salvation and the giving of your Son. Father, we continue to pray uh, this evening for our nation, that you watch over, protect, and guide it, being with our president, leading him in all his decision-making authority to honor your word and divine establishment principles. Continue to be with the congressmen, senators, Supreme Court, our local governments at the state uh, uh, level as well. We pray for each and every one of them, Father, and ask that you lead them all to honor our constitutions, your word, and your, especially your divine establishment principles with truth, honesty, and integrity. And we ask that you root out any evil that may be within our government and so that all that are in positions of power are there to serve not themselves, but ultimately the people who elected them and allow them to serve well, Father, to your glory. Father, we also pray for our policemen and our firemen, especially Zach and Jeff, and uh, all uh, the military as well. We ask that you lead, guide, and protect them in all their endeavors and keep them safe. We thank you, Father, for their service and their sacrifice, and we ask for healing for those who have been wounded and also for those who have given the greatest sacrifice. Father, we thank you, and uh, uh, thank you for their service and their sacrifice and ask that you be with their loved ones to bring healing and recovery in their life. And Father, this day we also continue to pray for the Wenstrom family and uh, Bill's sister Linda as well and uh, ask that you continue to be with her and allow uh, answers to come with her lung issues and also with uh, Mrs. Wenstrom and her dementia and the treatment for her and also Bill's dad with his heart and heart procedure. We ask that uh, that happen appropriately and him to get the right care and treatment according to your will. We pray for Donna Lamastro and ask that you uh, allow her COVID test to come back negative, but if it is positive, Father, keep uh, uh, her healthy and safe and allow healing and recovery and uh, get good treatment if she needs it. And uh, also continue to be with her daughter, Amy, who does have it, and bring healing and recovery in her life according to your will. And Father, we also pray for Barbara, Barbara Flint and her uh, heart issues, and ask that you continue to pray for her, Rob Stewart and his family, Karen Chico, my sister Linda, uh, also uh, uh, Larry and Judy, we continue to pray for them. Uh, Haley and uh, Jess and their pregnancies. We ask that you continue to protect and guide them and keep them safe and allow their pregnancies to be successful, uh, healthy as well in the coming days and weeks. And also continue to be with the Higginbottom family, Joyce Cronin, uh, uh, Betty uh, Ruda, uh, Christine, uh, and all the others that may be on our prayer list as well, Father. We just offer them up to you, knowing that you hear our prayers and you answer our prayers, and we ask that you mightily work in the life of each and every individual giving them strength and comfort by your word and by your spirit, and also work in their life for good health according to your will. So, Father, we also pray for travel blessings for my son and his family on Thursday night, uh, especially during the storm, and also my uh, cousin Seth and his family in next week ask for travel blessings there that they uh, are safe and healthy 
in those endeavors. So, Father, we thank you again for this time that you've given to us. We ask that you lead us now to lift up our hearts in song and in praise and concentration on your word as well. In Christ's name, amen. All right. Somebody wants to come forward <laughs> and lead us in our doxology. <coughs> and if you go rise, please. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With angelic hosts proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. Thank you very much. Please be seated. <coughs> All right, thank you, Terry, for the doxology and one and all. And uh, let's turn our Bibles, go to Luke chapter 16, Luke 16. As we continue to note the storyline of the rich man and Lazarus, who was the poor man, uh, not only in uh, welfare, but also in health. But we see how these two individuals had starkly different lives here on planet Earth. And then we see how they also have starkly different lives in all of eternity. The rich man who was an unbeliever ending up in Hades in the place of torments at one compartment in Hades. And then Lazarus, the poor man who was a believer, ending up in Abraham's bosom, also called the place of paradise, which was a compartment in Hades. So as we end this storyline, not today, but in the last section of it, we see in verses 23 through verse 31, the perspective of Hades, also called Sheol in the Hebrew of the Old Testament. Again, the perspective of Hades after death, where we see the two stark contrasts that are really the reversals of fortune compared to their life here on planet Earth. Because when they lived on planet Earth, one lived in great splendor and the other lived in great poverty, both in the welfare and also in his health as well. But because the one that had poor health was a believer... He ultimately was a saved individual, and when he died, as we see in our narrative in verses 22, now in verse 23, he went on into Hades in that compartment called Abraham's bosom, also known as paradise. But yet the rich man, when he died, he had a great life here on planet Earth with all his health and wealth and riches and uh, gaily living in splendor. But ultimately, because of his unbelief in Jesus Christ, he then went to the place called Hades and the compartment called the place of torments. And as we noted on Sunday, as we went through the graphics of this in uh, greater detail, we understand that the place called paradise has already been taken to heaven after Christ's resurrection. He again took that a compartment of Hades, which was full of, uh, uh, excuse me, believers of the Old Testament and brought them all to heaven. Yet the compartment called the place of torments remains inside of planet Earth and it remains that same place that is described here in our storyline, a place of torment and of agony. And we're going to talk a little bit about that this evening. But uh, before we get into some of that uh, detail, what I also wanted to remind you of is that, you know, Satan is the author of sin, as you know. From eternity past, he chose to rebel against God. And even when God gave him a choice to rebound and recover, or we could even say repent in that situation, and, uh, you know, accept the forgiveness of his sins and go back and be with God and our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in faithful worship and fellowship. He chose to reject that and stay 
in rebellion. And along with that, we know that one-third of the angels stayed in that rebellion with Satan, and they are called the fallen angels. And as a result of that, the angelic conflict began. As a result of their fall, God gave them an opportunity uh, through a trial, as we understand it. And in that trial, in the appeal of the sentence that God brought to them, where he sentenced them to the eternal lake of fire, the appeal brought about the creation of the human race. And in the creation of the human race, we are now working out the appeal trial to show and for God to prove his righteousness, justice, and love compared to the rejection of that that Satan had in eternity past. But with all of that, in the creation of mankind, as you know, man was created in perfection without sin. That's Adam and a woman in the garden. But Satan, having sinned in the past, brought that sin into the human race by deceiving the woman and then uh, uh, totally... <clears throat> winning over the soul of Adam to choose to sin and rebel against Jesus Christ, sin then entered into the world. And as a result of sin, now we know that sickness and illness, but also death has come into the world. So as a result of the angelic conflict and Satan's sin and rebellion, now we have death that has come into the world. As a result of that, as Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 says, Satan has the power over death. And why is that? Because sin brings about death. And we see that in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, and you can also compare that with Revelation chapter 6 in verse 8. But yet Hades, as we've been talking about, was the place and is the place where all members of the human race would go to upon their death. And why is that? As a result of sin in the world, death would come. As a result of death, all members of the human race went into that place called Hades. The believers went to paradise. The unbeliever went to the place of torments. But it was all due to Satan and sin being in the world and Satan having the power over death because of sin being in the world. As uh, such, we could call that the stronghold that Satan had. And a stronghold called death, again, that is brought into the life of every member of the human race, other than maybe Enoch and Elijah who were raptured, and the raptured generation, and maybe uh, individuals that live through the end of the millennial reign, I should say definitely the people that live to the end of the millennial reign. They won't suffer physical death, but every other member of the human race will suffer physical death as a result of sin being in the world. And for the Old Testament saint, they would go to Hades. The, in the New Testament, the saints, they now go directly to heaven as we've been talking about. But in any case, prior to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, death and Hades were the stronghold of Satan. And that's what he was leaning people toward. Lords. Rather than having them accept Christ as their Savior, let them stay in a state of rebellion and unbelief and then be sentenced to the uh, place called Hades, ultimately ending up in the lake of fire. So it was a stronghold of Satan, a powerful thing that he would use uh, in this world, again, to lead people away from their relationship with God. But yet, Lo and behold, God sent his son into the world, and that's the season that we're celebrating right now, this Christmas celebration, sent his son into the world, taking on humanity so that he could go to the cross and pay for the sins of the entire world and the sins of the, the angels in heaven as well. And as a result of that, death and Hades were conquered by the work of Jesus Christ upon the cross. And that's what we see in Colossians chapter 2 in verse 15 specifically, where it says, when he disarmed the rulers and the authorities. That he's talking about specifically Satan and the fallen angels, especially when we compare that to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. But again, he disarmed the rulers and authorities, Satan and the fallen angels that had a stronghold over death and Hades as well. And he said he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. And as we taught on Sunday, remember, Jesus Christ descended into that place called Hades when at the time there were believers and unbelievers down there in their two separate compartments. For the believer, he went down to rejoice and also to proclaim victory, but then to take them home and bring them to heaven where they now reside. But over the unbelievers who were in that place, what did he do? He also 
proclaimed his victory over sin and death that they had rejected. And as we also know uh, and uh, understood from Sunday, that Jesus Christ also has the power over death in Hades now, where he's going to take Hades one day, lift it up from where it is inside the earth. He's going to have all those members stand before him at the great white throne judgment seat and then judge them for their unbelief and then throw them into the eternal lake of fire. So again, Jesus Christ disarmed the rulers and authorities, the stronghold that the Satan and the fallen angels had over sin and death, and then ultimately Hades. And then he made a public display of them, showing his victory that was won upon the cross, proclaiming that literally when he went down into that place called Hades, and again, proclaiming it over uh, the uh, members of the human race who were unbelievers, but there's a whole other topic for another day that we haven't even got to within this, but we've done it in the past, where we talk about the place called Tartarus and the Abyss. All right, And there are two uh, uh, other places inside of planet Earth that are also holding places for what? Criminal fallen angels. Again, especially the, the angels that cohabitated with women in the time of Noah. So they are held in bondage right now inside the earth in Tartarus and uh, in Hades. Sometimes people call that, excuse me, the Tartarus and the abyss. Sometimes people just lump that all together and say, well, that's all part of Hades and those are other compartments, some for the humans and then some for fallen angels who broke certain rules and regulations about the angelic conflict. But any case, doesn't matter what we're talking about here. Jesus Christ proclaimed victory over them all. And even the angels who aren't incarcerated and locked up at this point in time, he proclaimed victory over them as well by going down to that place called Hades and bringing all the captives, believers, home and bringing them to the eternal state in heaven with God the Father. He had triumphed over them at the cross that he had won. And as such, Jesus Christ could proclaim his victory in the realm of the dead. And therefore, now death no longer has a hold. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. That great proclamation that uh, Paul made. And when he's talking about the resurrection of the church and what the resurrection body is going to be like. Ultimately, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? And that's what the earliest manuscripts read and wrote, but it's interesting that later manuscripts came along, and instead of saying, oh, death, where is your victory? They substituted it with Hades. Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Oh, Hades, where is your sting? But again, that was a later translation uh, where it was a synonymous term for death and the place where the dead would go. But the literal translation of the earliest uh, manuscripts, uh, I should say, uh, have, in the most reliable manuscripts, have, O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? There is no sting of death anymore for the believer because Jesus Christ has triumphed over death by winning the victory of paying the penalty for our sins upon the cross, and whoever would believe would have eternal life. So in 1 Peter chapter 3, and verse 19, it says, In which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. So we see another verse that tells us he made a proclamation of his victory. And he went and he did it in their presence, in their face, wherever they were. And again, these are the incarcerated demons uh, that are already locked up down inside the earth, whether the, it be the abyss, whether it be Tartarus. And then uh, uh, there's another compartment called the Euphrates River. It says it's under the Euphrates River. And again, a literal you know, uh, uh, interpretation. So... There's no wonder there's so much problem over in Iraq there, okay? There's a bunch of demons underneath there, bubbling up from time to time. No, I'm just kidding in, in that respect. But in any case, it says under the Euphrates River. And that's going to be a place where demons are loosed uh, during the tribulation from the abyss, from Tartarus, the Euphrates River. But ultimately, all of them, if they're, uh, you know, are going to be thrown into the eternal lake of fire at the great white throne judgment of Jesus Christ. And this is why Jesus Christ also said to Peter when he said, and again, I know the Catholic Church likes to say it one way, but we understand it another, uh, another way, when he said, I am the rock, okay? I am the rock. 
And basically, the church is going to build, be built on this rock. He wasn't saying, Peter, you're the rock, okay? You're a little rock. He used two different Greek words. You're a little rock. I'm the big rock, okay? I'm the big guy, basically, is what he's saying. And upon this rock, again, he was pointing back to himself, not on Peter, but on himself, the church will be built. And then it goes on to say that the gates of hell or the gates of Hades will not over. Power it. And that's what we have in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. And the gates of Hades cannot overpower the church of Jesus Christ. Why? Because he won the victory for all members of the human race, but especially for those who would believe that would be part of his church. Again, especially during the church age dispensation that we are a part of. So again, the gates of hell or Hades will not overpower overpower it. Again, you could also translate that Greek word into prevail against it. So again, as much as Satan wants to try to beat down the church, as much as he wants to try to beat down the individual Christian, God's will will be done and the gates of Hades and the gates of hell will not overpower the Christian ever. Why? Because they will not lose their salvation. They will not have their salvation taken away. They will not lose that salvation. And they never will end up in Hades nor the lake of fire. Yes, they may have difficulties and suffering in this life. They may even lose their physical death all the way, maybe up to the point of martyrdom within their life. But yet the gates of Hades will not overpower them because, again, take my life, please, okay? Take my life, please. Not take my wife, please. Take my life, please, okay? And uh, why? Because I'm going to be in heaven when it's all said and done. And I will be victorious because of my Lord Jesus Christ because he was victorious upon the cross. So that's what we understand about Hades, that it was a stronghold for Satan because of sin being in the world. But Jesus Christ overcame that stronghold and won the victory and proclaimed the victory, not only to Satan and the fallen angels, but also to mankind. And whether they were the believers down there in paradise or the unbelievers in the place of torment. Basically, proclaiming his victory and then showing the demonstration of that victory by bringing the believers that were there and now bringing them to heaven. And as we said on Sunday, and as Scripture tells us, no believer goes to Hades or Abraham's bosom, the place of paradise today. We all go directly to heaven, the third heaven, where we will be face to face with our Lord. So with all of that, there are also several erroneous viewpoints of Hades or hell that are floating around in the world, and sometimes they even creep their way into churches and religion, <clears throat> whether it be a Christian religion or other religions. They have crept their way in through Satan's deception and lies. And so we need to be aware of them, so if people present us with these things, we know how to refute them. And it's pretty simple when you basically know the Word of God and go back to the Word of God to give answers for their erroneous conclusions. And so the several erroneous viewpoints start with the second chance viewpoint, okay? And this is where we get doctrines like purgatory, where there's a second chance. Maybe you weren't a good enough person here on planet Earth. You'll go to a place of suffering for a little while, and if you straighten up while you're there, maybe, just maybe, you'll get out of that place. But many times they also say if your friends and family who are still here on planet Earth, if they pray hard enough, Give enough money in the offering plate. Have enough masses for them during this. Their life, uh, excuse me, uh, 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 after their life, maybe, just maybe, they will have a second chance and then they can get to heaven. And so, again, there's all kinds of erroneous doctrines and different shapes and sizes around that. But the fact of the matter is there are no second chances. All the second chances that people have are here on planet Earth. Once we leave planet Earth, there are no second chances. <clears throat> Excuse me. And for the unbeliever who has rejected Jesus Christ as their Savior here on planet Earth, once they leave planet Earth, there's no second chance. They go directly to Hades, and they'll wait there to the great white throne judgment seat, and then they'll be thrown into the eternal lake of fire. There are no second chances. Even though there are no unbelievers in Hades today, or hell, okay, 
there are no second chances. And why can I say there are no unbelievers there? Because once they get there, they all realize, uh-oh, I blew it. And I should have accepted Christ. I should have understood my Savior. And we're going to see that in our narrative as well, as the rich man even says, go back and tell my brothers. Go back and tell them so they don't end up here too. You see, in Hades, the unbeliever became a believer. But he rec- and he recognized his wrong. And we don't see anything in this narrative nor anywhere else that that wrong can be corrected at that point in time. Once they get to Hades, they will be in Hades or uh, for all of eternity, again, ultimately thrown into the lake of fire. But they will be there forever and ever and ever. There are no second chances. So when people think that after their death there is an opportunity to escape hell, and um, uh, I don't know if you've ever read Dante's Inferno, okay? And this is where some of this erroneous uh, uh, nature and thought comes in regard to what hell is all about and the different levels and cycles of hell and different things and maybe the uh, opportunity to escape hell. But that is not scriptural. And that book is not scriptural either, even though it could play off of some of the things that are in the Bible, but it's really not a scriptural book uh, by any means. But in any case, after death, there's still no escape from hell. There's no way out of Hades. And we see that simply in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It says, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after that, the judgment. In other words, you die, then there's judgment. And at that judgment, your, what you did here on planet Earth will determine what your judgment will be, whether you will continue to be in heaven in bliss with God or whether you ultimately will get thrown into the eternal lake of fire. So it's appointed unto men once to die, and after that comes judgment. And therefore, there are no second chances. And there's no getting better. There's no praying their way or buying their way out of uh, a purgatory or whatever you want to call it. But ultimately, there are no second chances for the unbeliever. Their, uh, their, state, uh, their state is sealed and locked in for all of eternity. Then there's the uh, other aspect of universalism. And this is what we can call the bleeding heart type of Christian, okay? Where again, hell seems too hard and harsh for the human mind and for the human heart. And we think, how could a loving God send anybody to the eternal lake of fire? Well, in essence, that's the argument that Satan made in regard to the angelic conflict. Because before the creation of mankind, Satan said, in essence, to God, how can a just and loving God sentence one of his creations into the lake of fire? How can you do that? And in essence, we understand that God said, okay, appeal granted. I'll show you that I am a just, a righteous, and a loving God, and I'll give example after example. I'll create a lower being, and I'll demonstrate to you my justice, my righteousness, and my love, and, and also my salvation that is open and available to all. And ultimately, he did that through his son, Jesus Christ, during his 33 and a half years that he was here on planet Earth. But in any case, <clears throat> many people find it difficult to accept a concept like hell. Yeah, it is a difficult thing. It is very hard. I wouldn't want anybody to go to hell, other than maybe Adolf Hitler or guys like that. Just kidding. All right. But in any case, we, you know, what hell is is absolutely horrible for anybody to be there. And because it is such a difficult thing for the human mind to wrap their head around and to understand the concept of eternal suffering and torment, they come up with the idea, well, God wouldn't actually do that. And really, all dogs go to heaven, okay? And basically, all are eternally saved. And again, uh, going back to even the previous uh, aspect where, again, there's the second chance view. Some even think that, well, they'll just go there and suffer for a little while, but eventually God will rescue them from that and bring them into heaven. Or what we're going to see in the third concept that's erroneous in just a minute. So uh, let's uh, see the answer to this first one. So universalism, all are eternally saved. Well, this basically denies the truth 
of the salvation message through Jesus Christ. If everybody's saved, then why have a Christ? Why have Jesus go and die for our sins if everybody is saved? Why have a doctrine that you have to believe in Jesus Christ in order to be saved if everybody is just going to be saved? Again, it denies the truth of the salvation message through the person and work of Jesus Christ. And it also denies the concept of free will volition that God has given to all mankind either to choose for or against his, his uh, uh, provision for salvation, his son, Jesus Christ. And that's why we have John 3.16, whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But if you don't believe, again, there is condemnation. John uh, 3.36 also uh, speaks to that, two of the great uh, salvation passages that we have in the Scripture. So, again, universalism denies the truth of what the Word of God has to say and what Jesus taught himself. As he talked to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, you must be born again. He who believes, again, has salvation. He who does not believe has already been judged. Again, they have a judgment waiting for them because of their unbelief. So uh, that is the erroneous thought that all dogs go to heaven. Uh, and uh, and uh, you know, no dogs go to heaven, as you know, because uh, they don't have souls and spirits like we do. But in any case, uh, that's another topic for another day. And I know I'm going to get a lot of hate mail because everybody wants their cats and their dogs to go to heaven and be with them for all of eternity. But there's nothing in Scripture that says that. There are animals in heaven. Maybe your animal will be in heaven, but probably not. Okay, so don't get your hopes up. But in any case, hate to be a Debbie Downer, but that's the way it is. All right. But in any case, uh, universalism is a false doctrine, and it denies the basic truths of faith for salvation, believing or not believing in the free will volition that God has given to mankind. Then the third is probably one of the most popular of these three, and that is what we call annihilationism. And basically, annihilationism means that hell, which we could also say Hades, which many times even shield is just used for the grave in the ground. Basically, <coughs> annihilationism thinks that people are just like animals. And once an animal's life is ended, it is ended. There is no eternal life for the animal. Remember all the sacrifices that God had uh, uh, the uh, Israelites commit in the temple in the tabernacle and how shedding of the blood gave its life. There was no more life for that animal after the fact. Well, annihilationists also believe that there's nothing more for the human after death. And they think once we die, we just die. And uh, I, I've, I've told some of you a story. I used to have a co-worker uh, way back in the day uh, uh, before I uh, left uh, the business world uh, over 20, about 20 years ago now. And, um, but had a good friend and uh, Christian and whatnot. And uh, he used to mention what his father used to say. And his father used to say, you know, once you die, you know, there's nothing after that. All there is is that ground. Six feet under the ground. That's all there is. And that's it. Okay. Real gruff and mean and kind of, you know, that way. But that's annihilationism. In other words, once we die, they believe the soul and the spirit are just destroyed. And there's nothing. And that's it. And it's just ended. And again, that's kind of a nice pie in the sky thing too. But it also makes you understand that it really doesn't matter what you do in this life. Because if there's no afterlife, who cares what you do now? Right? If you're just going to die one day and that's it and there's no existence after that, might as well grab all the gusto you can right now and do everything you possibly can. So that, too, is a false doctrine, and it denies many aspects of Scripture, including uh, what we see about the resurrection of the unsaved, first and foremost. And let's go to the Gospel of John, chapter 5. Let's go to John, chapter 5. <clears throat> Because we talk predominantly about the believer being resurrected to eternal glory. But as we've also seen in this study and uh, doctrine, especially of Hades, we know that the people who are in Hades will be resurrected too. They won't be resurrected to eternal glory, but they're going to be resurrected to stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 20. And once they stand before him, we know the story. We read it on, on Tuesday. We know what the doctrine is, that they are going to be uh, shown to be unbelievers because their name is not written 
in the book of life, and as a result, they'll be thrown into the eternal lake of fire. But the doctrine of annihilationism denies the resurrection, especially of the unbeliever. In John chapter 5, in verse 28, And again, this is a uh, greater passage, but here it just says in verse 28, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs shall hear his voice. So again, all that are in the tombs, the, the dead that are there, both believer and unbeliever, and shall come forth. Those who did the good to a resurrection, now I don't know if you have deeds in italics there, but deeds isn't in the original language, it just says does, did the good. And the good there is what? Believing in Jesus Christ. That's the good. Okay, So those who did the good to a resurrection of life, that's the believer. Those who committed the evil, and again, deeds shouldn't be in there. It's in italics in mind, but that means it shouldn't be there. Those who committed the evil to a resurrection of judgment. And again, what's those who did the evil? Again, rejecting Jesus Christ. That's the only sin that is not pardoned. It's the unpardonable sin. No forgiveness for that sin was won at the cross of Jesus Christ. It's the only sin Jesus couldn't pay for. That is the evil. And again, those individuals will have a resurrection of judgment. So annihilationism even rejects that. No, they're still there. They're in Hades, just like the rich man. They're alive. They're, they're uh, 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 conscious. They're living in their soul, but yet in torment and in agony. And they will be resurrected one day to stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ. And then, uh, because they are unbelievers, will be thrown into the lake of fire. It also denies what we're seeing in the rich man of the conscious torment that he's going through, that they too will be going through as we understand definition in the scriptures. And I'm going to show you a few passages in just a minute that speak to all of that and uh, give more definition of what it's going to be like in hell or the lake of fire, as it were, as it is already in Hades. But again, annihilationism denies all of that, all the entire doctrines of what happens to the unbeliever after death, what happens to the believer after death. And again, I, I would like to speculate, I don't know, Bill, if you have a thought in your head, how much of the Bible talks about the afterlife? You know, what percentage of the Bible talks about the afterlife? It's a Quite a bit, you know, 25, 30, you know, I won't say half, maybe, uh, no, probably not half, but probably 30%, I don't know, but quite, I don't know if you have any thought on that, but. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, well. Yeah, the annihilation, uh, annihilation is the most popular. Yeah, yeah, it's clever, it's easy, there's, you know, there's no pain, there's no suffering. Yeah, okay, <laughs> All right. add that with the article, there you go. <laughs> to judgment, yeah, yeah, and that's the unbeliever, yeah, so there it is. And uh, so in any case, you know, a, a, a very, you know, large part of the scriptures is talking about the afterlife and uh, what happens, and uh, annihilationism denies all of that. So the rich man, let's go back to uh, uh, Luke chapter uh, uh, 16. Let's go back to our passage. Because as we continue to understand the rich man uh, and Lazarus being down in Hades, in verse 22, it says, and in Hades, and that's where we launched into the doctrine of Hades and what we've been talking about. It says, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Okay, so I want to just give you a little bit about that. And kind of when I did the word study on this, it was very interesting, uh, the phrase being, because many times the word to be, or uh, you know, what we call to be, uh, is the a Greek word ami, which means to exist or is and be and just uh, go about. But this is not that word. It's hupo arco. Okay? And not only does it talk about being, but it also talks about possessing something that you possess. And I found that very interesting because the rich man's eternal state was now being in or possessing torment. Now, torment is the word basanos, and there you see the Greek up on the board, and that does mean to be tortured, to be tormented, and to be in great pain. 
And I found it interesting that our Lord, again through the uh, writing of Luke also, uh, chose to use the word hupoako, or hupako, uh, instead of just a me, just rather than existing, because that hupoako means what he possesses. And remember, this was the rich man who possessed much. He had great wealth that he possessed. He had great uh, fun and family and friends that he possessed. He had great health that he possessed. He had all the possessions that anybody would want in planet Earth. But now that he is off of planet Earth and in Hades, the place of torment inside of Hades, what is he possessing there? Well, he still has his soul, but what does that soul possess? Great agony in the torment that he is in. And that's what the unbeliever will endure for all of eternity. And that's all they're going to possess is that torment and that agony. This word is only used a few times within uh, the New Testament. But its cognates are used much more to talk about tormenting and the torturers and uh, great suffering and pain, uh, mostly uh, uh, in the eternal state, but also sometimes uh, here on earth as well. But that's what he's going to possess. He possessed all the earthly riches and wealth that anybody could have, but yet in the eternal state, the only thing that he possesses is great suffering and agony. And that's going to be the state for many a rich person who are unbelievers here on planet Earth. And again, I don't want to get into too much politics, but with this whole COVID virus thing, and you have this expert saying this and that expert saying that, and I love how many of these experts aren't even doctors, okay? And they're trying to predict what we're going to have and what we're going to do. And these are the rich and wealthy individuals, and they, you know, like this little lockdown that, well, I was getting into too much politics. I don't want to go too far. But again, These rich individuals of our world today who possess much and don't even give one credence to God for anything in this world, okay? They're all who possessing much are going to be like this rich.
We always have the backup, so always one works. But in any case, but on Facebook we don't even need it because they just get the audio direct. Yeah, it's pretty cool. But in any case, all right, battery's out. So again, the rich man in his soul is alive for all of eternity. Mental faculties, consciousness, awareness, understanding, make uh, able to make decisions and able to understand the suffering that they're going through and the reason why. And again, Scripture does not mention any change to their abode or to their state. Remember, those who, are in, uh, who were in Hades in the place called Abraham's bosom slash paradise, there was a change. They were brought from that place to the eternal state of the third heaven. And now that's where they are. And that's where we will go upon our death. But for the unbeliever, they go down into Hades and they will remain there throughout the remainder of human history, which if the rapture happened tonight would be at least another 1,007 years. And then after that, there will be a change of venue from Hades into the eternal lake of fire. But in regard to the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, there is no change to them. They remain there, and people who are unbelievers still go there today. And that will occur until, as we noted on Tuesday, excuse me, on Sunday, the great white throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20, verses 13 and 14. And as we see when the rich man looked across that great chasm, in, uh, which we call paradise as well, he saw Abraham and he saw Lazarus in his bosom. And as we've already noted, when we saw the uh, story of Lazarus dying and the angels carrying him to Abraham's bosom, we have the same uh, phraseology here where the rich man is seeing them now in Abraham's bosom. Remember that phrase for, or the word for bosom in Abraham's bosom is talking about a close, personal, and intimate relationship, a place of honor, a place of glory, dining at the table of our Lord for all of eternity. And that's what Lazarus was receiving. He had a close, personal, intimate relationship. He was in a place of honor right at Abraham's right-hand side, a stock contrast from his life where he was laid at a gate by the uh, the citizens of the town because of his destitute, both in wealth and physical destitute, No one helped him or lifted a finger for him, nor gave him a crumb from the table. But now, in the eternal state, he's in a complete opposite situation. Just as the rich man is now in a complete opposite situation in his place of torments, Lazarus is now in a place of great blessing, a a place of peace, joy, and happiness. And remember, and I probably could uh, throw that verse in now, and I'll just uh, mention it to you, but as The rich man is in a place of absolute darkness, unquenchable flame, in agony, um, with complete consciousness there. Again, in all that difficulty compared to his life on planet Earth, Lazarus is now in a place, as the book of Revelation also tells us, no more pain, no more suffering, no more sorrow, no more tears. And he's in a place of not only just not having those things, but now in great joy, peace, and happiness, being honored and blessed for all of eternity. So this is the state in the abode of the believer, and he will be in that place for all of eternity. At the time of Jesus speaking this, that was down in planet Earth, in Abraham's bosom, paradise. But as we've also noted many times now, now they all are in heaven face to face To the Lord. So now they're in a place of great joy, peace, happiness, and bliss. And Lazarus had suffering and difficulty in this physical life. All of that is now changed. All of that is now changed where he is in a place of absolute joy and happiness. No more suffering, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears. And when we pick it up again, uh, maybe on Thursday night if we don't have a snowstorm, but we'll talk a little bit more about Lazarus and the importance of the suffering that he went through in time and how that related also to the eternal state. So we'll pick it up on Thursday night if we're here uh, with that message. All right, so uh, let's close right now. Father, we thank you for this time. We praise you. We glorify you. We thank you for your son uh, completing the work of salvation on our behalf and the behalf of every member of the human race upon the cross. We thank you for giving us the faith to believe and providing us the great plan of salvation that so richly is in our lives. And Father, we just pray for all members of the human race who are alive in our generation that they do come to salvation and believe. And please use us as vessels of honor and glory to bring that gospel to them as much as we possibly can. 
So, Father, we ask for travel blessings on our way home this evening. In Christ's precious name, amen.